Hello, everyone. Welcome to another awesome Carolina Snowflake Meetup event. Uh, today, we will be going over Snowflake Health Checks. Super exciting topic here. These are our virtual meetup rules, just that we're all respectful and on mute and using the chat to ask questions. That way we can keep everybody in the loop and answer some questions that other people might have as well. And we try to keep all of the questions on topic. Video is optional and we always hope that you'll recommend or invite a friend and hit us up on Twitter if you want to reach out. Our previous meetups you can find on our YouTube channel, which is posted in the discussion board on our meetup group if you'd like to go back and check any of those out. And we usually get them up after a few days. Today, we are going to have a quick snowflake refresher as usual, and we will discuss our snowflake health checks and do a demo. And we will talk a little bit about the symptoms that uh, you would want to use a health check for. Um, and then we'll go over our upcoming events. So just a quick introduction for, for those that might be new to, to Snowflake, always welcome. I'm excited to, to have you and excited for your journey uh, that you're about to take or have maybe recently uh, taken as well. And for those that are more seasoned veterans, you, know, you understand the, the power and, and the goodness with, with Snowflake. Again, those that are, are new to, to Snowflake or maybe considering going to Snowflake, you know, what is Snowflake? You hear about the data cloud. I'll just think of, you know, that's the means to ingest your data, whether that's in another cloud source, on-premise, third-party, flat file, or a combination of all of the above and really centralizing that, that data, governing that data, controlling the access, but then also distributing that data. You know, perhaps there's an anonymized version of the data to distribute through a data share to an outside party as you look to start to potentially monetize your data or just make it easier for your internal and external customers to consume your data. And naturally, as your needs go up for whether it's processing, power, storage, power, the use cases from a data science to an end user, you can scale that as you see fit. And so lots of different uh, potential use cases for uh, Snowflake Data Cloud. We talked about some of those different types of, of sources, whether that's transactional enterprise applications, and just even all the way through IoT and pulling that data in at times. You may transform that data. You may normalize that data. You may aggregate that data or a combination of all of the above relative to you know, what are those different consumers within your organization and sometimes those consumers are real humans, and other times they are actually applications that will be consuming the data as well. Anupa, would you like to introduce our Snowflake health checks to everyone? So um, the idea behind uh, health check is to kind of have some form of mechanism that would give you a framework um, that given a Snowflake instance, um, how would you know what, what the health of the system is. So if, if you had a login um, to, to, to a Snowflake system, how would you know if the Snowflake system is kind of healthy or not? Uh, now, having said that, um, more than any specific technology or tool, it, it's more of a framework and philosophy as to how you look at health checks. But you could actually divide the entire concept of health checks into three major components. So you could have like a dashboard where you could monitor your Snowflake instance. And that dashboard is usually supplemented with some form of alerting mechanism. Uh, and then after you have the alerting mechanism in place, you would have some form of diagnostics that would indicate that, that given the information I get from the dashboard, which gives me my real time state of Snowflake. And when you match it with the alerts, what's the total score or the health of my Snowflake instance? So Heather, if you move to the next slide, right? This is what uh, this entire uh, explanation kind of boils down to. So you would have, I think for the dashboard, we have a very quick couple of minutes demo at the end where we will show a kind of dashboard that we're building at Data Lake House from a, from a health check standpoint. Um, but uh, once you have the dashboard up and working, you could have various form of alerts that would work with alerting the users um, based on your health check. So for example, if something has gone down or something is not as expected, you could have like a Slack message being set up or some form of email that goes out 
um, or some form of push notification that goes into your, maybe your, your uh, SMS or something where you could kind of alert the user or the admin and so on. And at the end of the day, you could kind of come up with a scoring mechanism, which could indicate, you know, uh, give your Snowflake system a score on like a, uh, on a base of 100 or 10 or whatever it is, and then kind of know what the, what it looks like. Um, moving on to the, to, to the next part. Um, now you could again have two major components of, of health check. One is more of a process alerting standpoint that we just spoke about right now. But keeping that away for now and just focusing on the technical side of things, uh, if you had to kind of evaluate a system on, on Snowflake, you could actually divide them into four major buckets. So the first bucket could be to kind of monitor general account parameters in Snowflake. Uh, and then the second could be kind of monitoring users. So it could basically be managing user authorization, um, user roles, um, grants, and so on. Um, and then login management and so on. And then you, uh, you could look at Snowflake objects. So you would basically look at your warehouses, what the warehouse execution looks like, how many warehouses are running, what's the size of warehouse, is any warehouse running on extra large for, for uh, and it's not required on extra large. Uh, what's, the, what's the database and, and, and the cost looking like? Uh, uh, is the cost of storage um, exponentially growing? Is it, spiral, is it spiraling? Then what's, what's required? Um, you would look at your time travel details. Do you have time tables set at 90? Are you making the most out of the time travel options in Snowflake? Um, and then you would look at tasks. Do you have any uh, long run tasks which are essentially um, suspended or they're kind of failing and so on. And at the end, I think we touch upon cost and usage, uh, which basically is again, your warehouse cost and your storage cost, just to make sure that your cost is managed under your budget on a monthly or yearly basis. So coming to that, um, as I said, we'll have a quick demo on um, for dashboard that we're currently building. And this diagram kind of gives an architecture of how this dashboard kind of works from an architecture standpoint. So essentially what we've done is we've built a streamlit, um, a streamlit UI that essentially uh, talks to like a fast ABI web server at the backend. And then uh, we've deployed each of these as container images to Google Cloud Run. And we're kind of executing this, this streamlit UI on the Cloud Run itself. So what I, we, we'll even see this, see this in the demo, but in principle, what the stream does is that it first kind of gets a, gets a OAuth um, bearer token to ensure that every call to the fast API is done with the bearer token and it's authorized. Once the authorization is done, it basically does a Snowflake connection test to ensure that, that, that the Snowflake parameters that we're logging in with are kind of correct. And then after that, it goes and fetches the account parameters uh, that's required for us to perform the dashboard and the Snowflake health check. And then it does user management to kind of get user information. And then it goes and fetches the Snowflake objects. So I think uh, I'll quickly move on to the demo, which kind of complements this, this diagram here. There's a question, I think, on the... On the Q&A, Streamlit free. You want to take that one, Mike or Anupav? Um, I um, I can start. Maybe uh, Mike can add to it. Yes. Uh, so Streamlit without the cloud version, when you use the Streamlit library, is in Python. That's completely free, and you can kind of use that to host on a different um, cloud. Um, uh, we've honestly not used the Streamlit cloud to kind of comment on that, but instead, what we've done is we've used the streamlit libraries and then hosted the uh, hosted that into our gcp cloud so that's that's completely kind of free and there is no licensing fee to pay for that yep uh, nice job if i only part i would add is if folks have additional questions or want to do a deeper dive or say well how can i get set up we're happy to have those conversations uh, with you so feel free to ping us uh, outside of the session here and chat with you Okay, so what you see right now is actually the, the Streamlit UI. And if you look at the link, it's been deployed to our um, GCP Cloud Run. And let me just refresh this 
while this refreshes, let me also kind of come back here. So this is essentially nothing, but this is the fast API server that's kind of running on the background. So if you see, we've also deployed the fast API Helgec um, web server on the cloud run. And it basically, if you look at the code here, what's happening here is that you have these endpoints. So these are basically your API endpoints that are called by the streamlet internally. And what, what the advantage of having fast API is that it's completely in Python, so it's quick. And unlike the other web servers like Flask and the other ones out there, this is based on the asynchronous um, method. So for example, you see this async definition, it takes the advantage of asynchronization execution to kind of speed up things. Uh, that's one advantage, but the other advantage is that it also kind of lets you have dependency. So for example, we specify the dependency that, hey, before you call any of these functions, make sure that you run this particular method where it ensures that the Snowflake connections are tested. And at the same time, before we, we run each of these Snowflake connections, we make sure that we, we do the internal auth check. Uh, and if any of the dependencies are not matched, those respective methods that we've defined in the, in the in fast API are not called. So that's some couple of good things. It's pretty fast once you, uh, there's a bit of a learning curve at the start, but once you get used to it, it's pretty quick, pretty nice, and it's kind of easy to build on. Um, so fast API kind of uh, um, runs on Ubicon server. So you kind of uh, execute the Ubicon server. This is just for testing that we've put on localhost, but at the end we've created like a Docker image and then we've hosted the Docker image on the cloud run itself. So you could kind of do a local test on your localhost. And if um, you're okay with it, you can go ahead and deploy it on the cloud. Now coming back to the actual streamlit UI, this is a streamlit UI. It's another Docker image that's hosted on um, hosted on, on the cloud. So let's see what happens when I do a quick refresh of the page. If you look at the top, every action on the streamlit kind of ensures that we have the bearer token operation done before any of the action is performed. So once I do a click on the health check, what it does is it does that OAuth verification again. And it's kind of running to start the process and it kind of starts calculating the parameters that need to calculate. This is some fancy graphics we've put. Um, but if you come down, you see we, we are trying to divide our parameters into three major buckets. So we've got some key matrix here. We've got some activity and usage and cost. And then this is like the progress bar, which kind of keeps a track of progress. Um, this is still a work in progress. We are probably around 30 to 40 percent there compared to where we plan to be in coming days. So a lot of matrix are yet to be added, but you can still see the principle that's out there. So based on the diagram that I just explained, this UI hit, hit the fast API, it fetched the time travel day. So that's a problem. So it, it, it tells that this system, oh yeah, uh, sorry, I forgot to talk about these parameters. These are essentially the Snowflake parameters. So that's the Snowflake account ID where you kind of specify the Snowflake account ID. And then you log in with the username and password. It's important that you log into a system that has um, any user as account admin. So that ensures that you have access to all objects. So once you log into a, a you log into a particular Snowflake account with the username and password, do a perform health check. It also checks that the Snowflake connection is successful. So it makes a call to the fast API uh, and then calls the endpoint for Snowflake connection and then ensures if it's gone through. After that, if it's gone through, it'll go on to kind of generate these details for us. So if you look at the first matrix, that's a problem. So uh, Snowflake gives you an option of 90 day backup, but in this particular case, it's not being configured. So you've got to go and manually configure, turn that on either at the account level, or you've got to go turn that on for each table and schema. But for, for us, for this particular account, it's not yet turned on. So that's one of the key parameters we indicated. Um, we've kind of shown the number of active users. We also kind of plan to put some form of indication around what this percentage is. Is this 80%, 70% and so on. It gives you that this particular system has a default time zone is America, Los Angeles. And that's a good thing to know because a lot of times Snowflake is connecting with systems like AWS, GCP, where data comes in UTC. And then you want to make sure that, the, that your time zone is matching with the time zone from source. So it's kind of one, one shop 
space to see that you have your time zone set as America, Los Angeles is required. You can kind of go ahead and then make it as UTC. Uh, before I go ahead, Heather, there are, I think, a couple of questions on the chat. Yes, let's see here. How was the front end written? Uh, so this is using Streamlit uh, libraries in Python. So this is completely in Streamlit in Python. So the, uh, using Streamlit libraries in Python. And then she would also like to know how is Streamlit compared with Grafana and what's the advantage of this dashboard? Um, that's a good question. To be honest, I'm not really a, an expert in Grafana. So that's a kind of difficult question for me to answer. But in case if you have Mike or Christian who want to kind of take a stab at this, they can. Okay. So what I'll do is maybe not talk about Grafana, but I could quickly talk about some of the um, advantages as the second part of the question of Streamlit is. So for example, if you happen to be um, a company that's completely um, a Python shop, right? So you've got, let's say that you have a lot of scripts and code, which, which is running in Python. You could have machine learning scripts, machine learning code, which is running completely in Python. And you don't want to kind of spend your time to kind of build a UI in JavaScript or any of the UI tools to kind of see what the output looks like. Streamlit gives you an option to quickly use Python libraries and have a UI up and running within the Python framework itself. So one good thing is I did not have to go or code anything else outside Python to have this end-to-end -end functionality. So picking up data from Snowflake, looking what the output looks like, I could do completely on Python itself. And now you've got, uh, I think uh, recently there's been some form of uh, partnership between Streamlit and Snowflake. So it's kind of become easier to integrate Streamlit as part of the Snowflake ecosystem also. That also kind of gels well. So if you look at the entire direction where Snowflake is going, so Snowflake is trying to integrate Python as part of uh, Snowpark and the other libraries. So I think as part of the entire ecosystem where you have Snowflake as part of the backend, you have Python as a processing engine, and then you have Streamlit, which is again in Python as part of the same ecosystem without stepping out. So it kind of takes down the time of development. So for example, it did not take me more than a couple of days to have this entire UI up and running. And then it took me half a day to kind of go and deploy it on cloud and we had like a UI which is up in like two days, pretty quick. And the other good thing is, uh, it may not be as powerful as JavaScript or the other UIs, but most of the requirement that you would have from, from a simple UI up and running, that is definitely kind of satisfied by streaming. So for example, I did not have to do anything um, uh, that is I needed from a UI that was currently not available on Streamlit. But I, I think we may have some other people on our team that are familiar with Grafana. So maybe what we can do is once we um, get a little bit of background on Grafana from them, we can probably add something to the discussion board in our group. That way we can fully answer your question later on. Perfect. So since I've done a refresh, I can just go ahead and do a fetch check again. So it's running in the background. Gets me all the... I love the snow. <laughs> it's a nice touch. Yeah, it takes your uh, focus away while the time the, the processing happens. So that's one good effect. You also have balloons. You can actually blow balloons if you want that. Anyways, um, coming back to this. So, it's, so if you go back to the second tab, as you see, we've got other information. So for example, we've picked up all those users that have account admin but don't have MFA enabled. So it gives you a quick list here. It's helpful that I'm right query in Snowflake. Then we've got all the users that are not assigned default growth. It's good to have, it's good practice to have all the users assigned to because Snowflake is a role-based access control system, right? So good practice is to make sure that instead of looking at the users, you look at the role level. Uh, role level. So it's good to have all users mapped to roles in Snowflake. So if you don't have any default role mapped to them, may it may not be a deal, it may not be like a deal killer, but it is a warning that you need to have uh, default roles. That's, that's good to have. And then you see that around more than approximately 70% users have not reset passwords within 90 days. Um, so I would definitely recommend 
you to kind of have uh, your, your users uh, reset their password within 90 days and so on. So uh, it's, still, it's still a lot of things are to be added here that we're right now adding it and it's kind of being deployed. It's not yet de uh, deployed uh, to cloud, but we plan to add more parameters here, which make it easy to kind of evaluate the health of the system from a user standpoint. But if I go to usage and cost, you see here, we were in one around warehouse execution time. So by just click on it, it tells you that by looking at the warehouses, it shows that in the last 30 days, I have had these warehouses which have run the maximum on my system. So just like we've got where execution time, we plan to have things like um, a database um, um, storage, uh, what's the storage that's been in the system for, let's say for the last one month. And then we also plan to add something kind of credit usage that what's the credit usage you've had for the last month and so on. So as I said, we, we still, we, we are still in the, in, in the, um, early stages of this dashboard, we plan to add few things. And there's one thing that I think it's not working right now, but that's the download data. So it, what this would do is that as soon as you click on the download data, it's going to download a CSV file on your system, which would have all those tables, details in one single workbook that you can open and see, uh, which might not make sense to have it on the UI given we don't want to clutter the UI too much, but if you want to see the details, just go download data. It'll give you all the details that you want to see with what's happening and what's going on. Sorry. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Jocelyn has another question. She's asking if Streamlit is like Dash and Python, and what's the advantage of Streamlit over Dash? Yes. So um, it is very similar to Dash. Uh, Dash has its own advantage that um, it is very closely related with Plotly. And if you go to Plotly, Plotly is kind of connected with Dash. You basically run a server on Dash too. So you could do a lot of things on Dash also where you just spring up a server and then you kind of start running it. And so you could have Dash, you could have Flask, you could have uh, Streamlit, you could have all of these up and running just that they have their own different flavors and functionalities. I am not very sure if you are, if you can get these kind of UI elements in Dash, just the way you can get it in Streamlit. I know Dash is very powerful. You can have your plots, you can have your tables, you can have all of those which you can do on Plotly on Dash also. But uh, I would be surprised and I would be like to be corrected if you can have all of these on Dash also. But having said that, if Dash meets a requirement, no harm, go for it. But uh, as I said, uh, there is a conscious effort from Snowflake to have Streamlit as part of its app. So if, if you go to Streamlit nowadays, sorry, if you go to Snowflake, they're talking about um, Snowflake Marketplace, where they're looking at having um, Snowflake end-to-end -end apps where Snowflake is the packet and Streamlit is a UI being kind of exposed on the marketplace. So uh, having said that, you would expect a lot of developments, a lot of support from the Snowflake ecosystem, Streamlit in future. And that's why we want to kind of keep us um, constrained with Streamlit, but there is no harm in moving to Dash also if that meets our requirements. Just like, just like we, we run Streamlit as a server, you run Dash as a server, you deploy Dash as a server too. But it just, it just matters if it's able to satisfy all these UI requirements that Streamlit can do it for you. So Heather, that's Dash and was there anything else? Did I miss in the question? Yes, I believe so. Thank you, Anupav. So yeah, this slide's just showing the symptoms. Uh, that this can help diagnose so misconfiguration, spikes, any kind of neglected housekeeping, errors, failures, timeouts, um, different uh, issues with usage, that kind of thing. All right, so for those of you who do not know, we are AICG developers of the Data Lake House platform. And if you have any interest in Data Lake House, you can check it out at datalakehouse.io. If you're interested in a health check, I am also going to put it, the link in the chat for you guys. And datalakehouse.io is a data warehousing as a service platform. Um, we offer ELT with no code whatsoever. There's some machine learning used. We have analytics, pre-built data models, 
and uh, dashboard visualization. So it's a pretty cool platform. If I do say so myself, I recommend checking it out. And here is a little bit of details on our Snowflake Health Checks if you're interested in booking one. Does anybody else have any other questions that we didn't get a chance to answer? If so, please stick them in the Q&A and we will try to answer anything that comes up. All right. Well, if any questions do come up, you can always reach out to us on Twitter or you can reach out in the discussion boards in the Meetup group or when the YouTube comes up in the comment section there as well. All right. Our next event will be this week on Wednesday, which is a little different for us, um, at 4 o'clock Eastern instead of our typical Monday night at 6 Eastern. And we will be going over bringing Ceridian Day Force data into Snowflake. Those invites were sent out um, through the meetup group, so they should have came directly into your inbox. If anybody did not receive an invite that would like one, please drop your email in the chat to one of us and we will send you the invite information. All right, that is all we have for you this evening, but we hope to see you on Wednesday to go over how you can get that Ceridian Day Force data into your Snowflake. Thank you all so much and we hope you have a great night.